on the first Sunday of a new year, I want to begin by asking a question, and uh, how would you complete this sentence? And it is this, my number one goal for 2020 is, now I know that can be just a whole lot of stuff. You think about it before you write it down somewhere, and I hope you'd write down a good answer to this question. What is most important to me? How how, how do you complete that sentence? What one word, phrase would you use? My number one goal in life in 2020 is to be happy, comfortable, successful, to be loved. How would you answer? My number one goal is to have fun, to retire, to get married, raise a family. My number one goal in life, to be well-known, popular, acknowledged. And this is so important. If you haven't ever thought about this, it's one of these things that it just, it just happens. And you you say, well, I want to, and we have our thing we say, but yet nothing about our life really flows from that. So it's probably something else that is our dominant life principle. And everybody has one. Dominant life principle, it's, it's like the lens that you see your whole world through. So every time you're making a choice, every decision that you make, how you do family and how you do friends and how you do work, a lot of it's going to flow through that dominant life principle. It's, it's, the, it's the navigation of your life going forward. So it's really important that you think through what is going to be the most important value in your life and In the midst of this, I hope, and we're always working on this, that when you come to decide those kind of things, life-altering, eternity-touching things, that what God's Word has to say would be the thing that's a driver. It would be the thing that directs. God hasn't left these things to chance. He's not just leaving us guessing, I wonder what God's up to and what He would expect from a guy like me. But He's given us a whole lot of good direction and focus in this discussion. God's word says this, do everything in love. That's pretty big, right? Do everything in love. It comes as a command from God's word. Another translation, same verse, let love be your highest goal. So it's not success. It's not possessions, power, privilege, prestige, comfort, money. Love is the main thing, and this is not the only time this is going to show up in God's Word. We're going to survey a good number of verses about this. So make love the highest aim of your life, and why is that? Because God is love. How about that? How about them apples? God is love, and God's goal for your life is that you would be like Him, and so if you're going to reflect Him, His character, His person, then love is going to have to be a big deal because God is love. Bible does not say God has love. It says God is love, and he created you to be the object of his love, and he created you to be like him, and he created you to learn how to love others as he loves others. Questions, uh, why didn't God just create you? There is you in all your glory. God has created you. And now, yet he did such a good job on it, he's just going to zip you right on up to heaven and be with him forever and ever. And we're all done here. Why did he leave you here? Why didn't he just zip you up to heaven? Why are you still hanging around? And goodness, what a world it is, right? We talk about it. It's a broken world. Don't have to look very far. Don't have to watch much of a newscast to determine. It's a broken world. And So we're in this world where there's sin and suffering, sorrow, sadness, problems, pressure, stress. And why didn't God just create you and then deliver you from all of that and get you with him in a perfect heaven forever? Why does he allow you to stay here on this earth for these years? And the reason for that is to learn how to love him and to love the people around you in his name. Life is about learning to love. In fact, one day... Jesus is walking along, and when Jesus is walking along, there's always somebody wanting to talk to Jesus, spend some time with Jesus. Sometimes they're his enemies, and they just want to get, try to see if they can trap him in an in a off statement, try to trip him up. Sometimes it's people that genuinely just need a word from God, and they know Jesus has such a word. 
this guy comes up to him and says, okay, so we have all the law and the prophets, you know, most what we would call our Old Testament. We, we, we got the law and the prophets, and it's all kinds of stuff in there that we ought to be doing. Some things, you ought to be doing this, and some don't do that. So now, out of all that stuff, I mean, I recognize you've given us a lot of direction, a lot of things to think about. Uh, how many of you, oh, I'm curious, I didn't ask the first service this, so I'm going to ask you, because you're better people than they are. Don't tell them I said that, but you're better people. How many of you read through the whole Bible in 2019? Well, praise the Lord for you guys. Way to go. Uh, I, I did a time and a half, a little time and three quarters. I just about did two last year. And in the second round in December, somehow it just fell this way for me to celebrate uh, all the things of December. I was reading Leviticus. And so I'm thinking about some of these guys. This guy comes up and asks Jesus this crazy question. Okay, what's the most important thing? Because he says, you know, like, I'm familiar with a lot of that stuff in that part of the Bible, but... And it's kind of hard to get my head around, but I know all that stuff about sacrifice the animal this way, carve them up that way, sling blood this direction. I know that's in there, but is, is is that the main thing, or... Is there something I'm missing? Where, where do I really need to focus my attentions? And in response, Jesus gives us what we call the great commandment. And this is in the gospel according to Mark. And uh, I hope you have a copy of God's word. If you don't, uh, make use of one of those pew Bibles. But we'll pick it up in verse 29 where Jesus answered. So Mark 12, verse 29, Jesus answered. The most important is, listen, O Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second, love your neighbor as yourself. There are no other command greater than these. Two sentences, Jesus answers this big sweeping question. What's the most important thing? And he said, really, everything about the scriptures is all summed up in these two things. Love God, all heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we've got all the bases covered. And that's pretty clear. Nothing is more important than those two things. Learn to love God with all your heart and learn to love everybody else. And he said, you get those two things, you got it. Of course, it's not like, oh, okay. Well, check and check. Because it doesn't quite work that way, does it? It's a little more complicated than, okay, now I know it in my head what I ought to be doing, therefore it's done. This is a lifetime of what does this look like? How do I live it out? What What does it look like in my relationship to God? What does it look like in my relationship to people? And it's a big sweeping command, but it's God's plan for all of us. Life is about learning to love, and everything else is secondary. Make love your highest aim. Doesn't mean other things aren't important, other things don't count, but this is, the, this is that dominant life principle we're talking about. If you go through all through life, and it doesn't matter you know, how much you acquire, how much you achieve, how many accomplishments you have, how many awards or rewards you've accumulated, how famous you become, none of that matters. And this is something I think a lot of Christians don't ever really wrestle with. One of these days, you're going to stand before God and give an account for your whole life. How about that? It isn't just, well, God loves me no matter what. Doesn't make a difference what I do or don't do. Because I prayed a prayer once, and I got baptized somewhere along the way maybe, and so I'm all good. We give an account for this life He's entrusted us. All these days on planet Earth that God gives us. There's going to come a day when I stand before Almighty God and He says, what would you do with everything I gave you? What would you do with all those things I entrusted to you? What would you do with the life that I've uh, I've handed to you on planet Earth? Did, Did you learn to love me with all your heart? And did you learn to love your neighbor as yourself? Because uh, we don't want to miss this. It's, It's about love. The Bible says this. It's 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Do everything 
in love. Now, I went to a Baptist college and I got a degree. And I went to a Baptist seminary and I got a degree. And I'm all degreed up. And to do both of those degrees, I had to take four years of New Testament Greek, different than modern Greek, New Testament Greek, and had to become fairly proficient in translation. And so words are important. I believe the words of God, every word in the Bible is inspired by God. I know you, you, you folks, you're like, oh man, he's going down this road again. Because some of you are used to me talking about my expertise in the Greek language and how important it is. So here, here it comes. This word translated everything, the full meaning in the original Greek text, it means everything. That's all it means. Everything. It means everything all the time with everybody. Do everything in love. Now, what does everything include? Anybody? Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Everything. Everything you do must be done with love. And that's not my idea. It's God's idea. So let's, by the way, I am 2020. I mean, everybody, oh, man, this is going to be the year that we make this trip. We've been planning it. And, you know, this in a few months down, we're going to go here. We're going to do this. We like to buy our house. We like to remodel our kitchen. We like, everybody make it, makes plans for a new year. For me, on the pastoral end of things, uh, we, we've been in our, in our ministry team here. We've been looking at 2020 for a while. And here's what we say. I am not looking forward to 2020. Because... Based on early returns, this presidential election year is just going to be a beatdown in all kinds of ways. And it's going to be divisive. And it's going to be divisive down to, down to families and friends and churches. That people are going to come out on opposite ends of a lot of stuff. And if we don't get this love thing squared away, how about this? In a divisive caustic, mean-spirited world, what if we were a lighthouse in the darkness of that shining for Jesus? And that's what our desire for our 2020 as a church. And we're going to have to work at that because it is not the way everybody around us is going to go. So do everything in love. So does that, does that include your social media? Well, apparently not for most people in the world because everybody's just putting up their, uh, their, their video and their, and their visuals and their statements and everybody's uh, going at each other like a couple of rabid dogs. And it doesn't quite seem that that's, there's a lot of Jesus in that, right? What if, what if we were the people who didn't do it that way? Well, I, I speak the truth. Yeah, well, we've got to speak the truth in love. How about that? The Bible tells us that. In everything, including what we do with social media. Everything. That, maybe you should write that by the, on your computer, or tape something to your phone or something that just says, in everything, love. What about if it's the... Uh, if it's just a fast food restaurant, you go in and you order because you need to get in and get out. You got to get back to work, or you're you're on your way to a game or whatever you're doing. You do all that stuff, and they order it. You sit down. And you got to eat this quick, and it is so messed up, and you're so frustrated. Don't you have every right just to berate some poor teenager over that? Isn't that your right as an American? Do everything in love. Does that include when you're, you're going to the parking lot and you are obviously waiting for this person to pull out so you can pull in and some guy in a small enough car to do it does a U-turn and whips it in front of you. And then you have to go somewhere else and park. But they're slow getting out of their car because they're kind of celebrating what they did. And you... You come walking up just as they're getting out of their car. Well, you can just kind of 
Hey, hope you have a great day. And, is that, or do you do everything in love? Everything. Does it include being nice to people who vote differently than you? Whichever way you vote. Does it include, does love include even that? Does it include responding to people who attack you, belittle you, make life difficult to you because of your faith in Christ? You have to love those people too. Now, this is what I'd like for us to get better at in 2020. And, and there's some things to do about that. We throw this word around a lot, by the way, uh, because I know for me, I love hot dogs. I love ice cream. I love salsa. I like to eat salsa and then have ice cream because it helps to neutralize things and it's a health pl plan for me. I love my wife. I love America. I love Jesus. Well, not all the same way, not all the same level, but what, what does love look like in this world in which we live? And I want to give some definition to that as we move through the five things quickly that uh, we have here from God's Word. The first thing to, to remember in the middle of all this is that we love because God loves us. You got to understand the source of this. We love because God loves us. God is love, and all love comes from God, and we love because He loves us. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God, knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. Man, now that's a little harsh because God is love. The reason why God wants you to love is because He is love, and it is His character, it is His person, it is His attribute his primary attribute, God is love. Everything else, I believe, flows from that. And he wants you to be like him. That's why you're still around. He wants you to be like him, to reflect his character through the things you do, the things you say. God is the source of all love. The Bible says we love because, this is 1 John 4, 19 now. There's a lot about love and God's love and all this stuff in 1 John. We love because he first loved us. God is the great initiator. Uh, we think, uh, well, I'm a good person, so I, it's kind of come from me. Well, no. In our sinful nature, I know I would never do anything out of love except that. God has inspired it in me, prompted me by the Holy Spirit, guided me to, to that commitment, to that decision. I love because God loved me first. He's first in everything. And the only reason you love God or you love anybody else is because God first loved you. And you say, well, I'm not sure if God loves me or not. You know what? The Bible says this over and over. I know this is a hard one because life is hard. It's a broken world. Sometimes it's choices you're making. Sometimes other people's choices just slam into your life. But God forever proved his love for you when he sent his son, Jesus, to live a sinless life, to die on a cross, for our sins, to pay our sin debt, miraculous, raised from the dead, victoriously resurrected from the dead, alive forevermore. And by acknowledging, God, I am a sinner and I want to turn from my sin, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin, was raised from the dead, and I surrender my life, my whole life, to him from this day and every day. He is Savior and Lord in my life. And He has proven His love so completely and so fully. Because see, His plan isn't just that today works out great. That business is successful in 2020. That uh, relationships are problem-free in 2020. It's a lot, his plan is a lot bigger. His plan reaches to eternity. And that eternal perspective is the part that we see his love on display through the journey that leads us to an eternity with him. He created you that, and he shows what love looks like, that we might come to love the way he loves, to respond to his love, and then to share that love freely with other people. So here in January, some of you are you know, making resolutions, I know, and in places where you feel guilty, like, I didn't measure up last year, fell short here, there. Uh, 
And that's awesome. I mean, it's a good time of year to do it. I'm, I always use January, to, really the last week of December, to do some, okay, here, 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 in the different areas of my life, places I want to take a next step, where I want to grow, where I want to be different, where uh, I, I want to solid, put down some anchors to hold. Uh, I do want to set you free on that, though. If you're reading through the Bible and you get to that first genealogy in early Genesis, and, and that stops you from reading any more of the Bible, you're free to restart in February. That's, that's my get-out-of-jail-free card for you. You don't have to just abandon ship and say, well, I blew it again. I've missed my Bible reading for two weeks, last two weeks of January because that genealogy in Genesis threw me for a loop. So I'm going to put my book Bible back on the shelf, and I'll start again next January. You have this Bible that's only worn out in the first 13 chapters of the Bible. Listen, you can start... You can start and make a new choice any time, but now is as good a time as any. Um, except when that stick, to, just just for my sake, I don't know if you if you're exercise regularly, you go to the gym. Just don't go to my gym. If you do go to my gym, stop going and give up, because it just crowds me, man. Don't crowd me at my gym, and that's all I have to say about that. You can go to other people's gym, just not mine. I like to pretend like it's just my home gym. These people are very uncomfortable today. You know what the problem is with this whole love thing? And I think this is really true. That we say, you know, you're right. You're right about that. Love God, love people. You're right about it. I know. I just don't love God enough. And what I'd like to tell you is that is just not so. That's not the problem at all. The problem has nothing to do with you loving God enough. The problem is you don't realize how much he loves you. Because if you realized what Jesus did, how much God loves you, how concerned he is for every detail of your life, I'm telling you, you couldn't help but love him back. If you really, if you really laid hold of that truth, you couldn't help but love him back. And you couldn't help but start radiating that out to everybody else. who does, They do not know that love. They do not know that peace. They do not know that joy. And they need to know the Lord. You just don't understand how much he loves you. And if that's the case, then there's a deficit in your heart that, that starts showing up in weird ways in other places of your life. That illustration is a great illustration of a tube of toothpaste. You squeeze a tube of toothpaste, what comes out? Well, hopefully it's going to be toothpaste, right? Right? Well, when you're life, you're going you're gonna to have pressure and you're going to have difficulty and you're going to have stresses. And, and when things start to squeeze in on your life, whatever's inside of you, that's what's going to come out. And if it's not God's love, it's going to be anger or fear, uh, bitterness, a whole lot of other things start coming out. And you can fake it for a long time. You can, hey, I'm all good. Everything's great. But when the pressure's on, and it will be on in the year ahead of us at all kinds of different levels, when it starts to squeeze you, that's when you find out what is really inside of you. And when that happens, you're not going to be able to love anybody else because until you've got God's love in you, it's never going to work out. So do you know the love of God? Do you rely on the love of God on an ongoing basis? And if you don't, you're going to have a hard time loving people. It's, it is... Well, I love everybody. I've heard people, a lot of people say that. I love everybody. No, you don't. You love people that are easy to love. You love people that are close to you, people that agree with you, people who uh, you share the same worldviews. It's those people, they're easy to love. But see, in this story of love, it's not those people. I don't learn a lot about love by loving people who already love me back. We'll talk more about that in a second. It's the unlovely, the unlovable, the difficult to love, the hard people in my life. Though that's where God, that's where God starts stretching my love, my love of, of people, my ability. There's a there's some muscle that develops when people are hard to love, and loving people around you, you don't feel like loving. You can't do that unless you got God's love in you. When you have God's love in you, anything is possible. Love happens because we're loved by God. Now, the next things will go faster than that. Love is a choice, and love is a commitment. It's the second thing. You choose to love, and you choose not to love, but it's a choice. 
we have this myth in our culture, American culture, that love is uncontrollable. It just happens. Uh, we, we have it in uh, some of the language that we use to talk about love, that, but love is a choice, love is a commitment. The language we use, oh, uh, one of our, a dear uh, gentleman in our church uh, was passing out bulletins before the first service. He said, I'm so grateful for the new year. Tell me why. And uh, this is Charlie at the front door, those of you who know Charlie. He said, because it's January and Hallmark is done with those Christmas movies. <laughs> and uh, any of you men give us an amen on that? Thank you, brothers. I appreciate that. You can work that out when you get home. Yeah. And here's what happens. We, we, just, we just fell in love. I was just walking along and there was this ditch beside the road and I just fell in the ditch. I just fell in love. I had no control over it. It just happened. That's not what, that's not what love is. Love is a choice. Uh, I get to be a part of a lot of weddings, a couple stands before family and friends, and, and I ask them, so how do you feel about each other? Well, no, feelings come and go. In fact, a lot of people, that's when marriage doesn't go well. When somebody says, well, I just don't feel, well, that's because you don't love, because love is not a feeling. Love, love is an action. Love is something that you do. It's a choice. It's a commitment. And so in a wedding ceremony, we do a lot of, do you commit before family and friends, before other? Do you commit? Do you make a choice? Do you declare, this is where I stand? Otherwise, when the emotion is gone, uh, things begin to unravel. I choose this person for the rest of my life. And that's true of all relationships when it comes to love. Love is a choice. Moses said, choose, he's telling the Israelites, choose to love the Lord your God and commit yourself to him. And that same principle is true about all relationships. You choose to love God. And God, by the way, God doesn't, he invites you. He initiates the relationship. But he's looking for you to reach out in faith and commitment and say yes. He doesn't force you to love him. You can thumb your nose at God. Plenty of people do. You can go a different way. You can destroy your life if you want to because love can't be forced. Love is a choice and a commitment. And the challenge in this love thing is you have to choose to do it. The third thing, love is an action, not just an emotion. It's more than attraction, arousal, sentimentality. Today, the songs of love, I've always enjoyed this uh, sarcastic version of it. Uh, I've got a quiver in my liver. It's an ocean of emotion. Well, when the emotion is gone, does that mean the love is dead? And for a lot of people, it does, because that's not love to begin with. Love is an action. It's something you do. Love is a behavior. In the Bible, we're commanded by God to love each other. And you can't command emotion. Like, I can tell you right now, okay, be afraid. Well, you could all put on your oh, I'm afraid uh, face, and you could pretend it, but I can't command an emotion by just declaring. Oh, uh, any of you as parents, uh, you ever done this with your children? Because uh, I did, and I'll confess it now because they're not here. Um, you ever said to your children, when they're whiny, gripey, crying about stuff, you've, you put a smile on your face, mister. You suck it up and you be happy. I don't care how tired you are. We're at Disney World. We're going to enjoy every second of it. <laughs> yeah. You ever command emotion? I'm trying, Daddy. I'm just tired and hungry. Yeah, well. The Bible says... Some of you really, well, I need to work on that. Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and truth. Action and truth. You can talk a good, I love everybody, but do you really love everybody? Let's see how you act toward them. Love is something you do. It's not, uh, uh, in fact, you do it even when you don't feel it. When you feel like you'd love to do anything besides love them. Now, anyone who's ever had children, some of you are in this game right now, and I feel for you. And I remember with our first, our son, we went four months with just, it was colic, and we could not 
us and the doctor, we just couldn't break that pattern. Four months, and it was miserable. And, and I, 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 you know, we'd get up multiple times a night, and Rhonda would make me get up multiple times too. She, after she did, she figured she'd done her part. She did plenty of her part in this one. Get up, and you go in there, and just he's you know, he's miserable and he's crying. And, I'm tired, but you know, when I went in there, this is what I'm thinking. Uh, I got way too much sleep. I'm spending too much time sleeping tonight. Two o'clock in the morning, what else do I have to do besides come in here and let him scream in my ear for a while? That's not why I got up. I got up because I loved him. And, and, and that took me past everything I felt and everything that would be my natural inclination in life. A lot of you parents have played those, uh, played those scenarios. You do it because it's the loving thing to do. Love is an action, not an emotion. In the book of James, James talks about, okay, you guys are doing a lot of big talk about all your faith stuff and what you believe and what you're... Well, hey, how about, how about show me what you're doing about your faith? Work the same thing with love. Love says not, I feel it, I don't feel it, Love says, I'm going to act on what is uh, in your best interest, what can care for you, what can meet your need. Otherwise, it's worthless, James says. Some of you, you say, well, this person, you just don't know how awful they are. I don't feel like acting in love toward them. I'd like to just punch them. So if you'll start acting in love, here's the thing. The feelings follow the action. Action doesn't follow feeling most of the time, but feeling follows action. If you act first, in the book of Revelation, Jesus says to the church uh, at Ephesus, you've left your first love. You just, you're off track. Like the, the, the kids, you turn to the right to the left. Well, you just veered off in the wrong direction. You've left your first love. And then he says three things they, they should do in response. Remember then how far you have fallen Repent, turn away from the sin that has led you in the wrong direction, and do the work you did at first. It's about the action. And the action is where the love is demonstrated. It's uh, in, in, in all the things that we make with uh, resolutions in a new year. Like for me, like I felt God prompting me to do some new things in my prayer life. And so I spent some time over the last couple of weeks reorganizing some things, restructuring what my prayer life looks like and how I want to live that out in the new year. But if I only prayed when I felt like praying, I probably would never get around to praying. You know why? Because Satan's going to make sure I never feel like it. Well, I know I was going to read my Bible this morning, uh, but I just didn't feel like it. Well, you're never going to feel like it. What, what you do is you do the right thing and you do what honors God. You do what God has called you to do. And when I pray and when I read my Bible, what I find is I start loving my time in prayer and my time in God's Word more. That's true for any number of things. Feeling follows action. Now, this is uh, a little bit of a test from the Lord, especially when you don't feel it. Because God's saying, are you willing to do it when you don't feel it? Because that's what moves us forward, I think, in spiritual growth. Are you going to learn to love me, God says? Are you going to learn to love other people when you don't feel like it? You act your way into feeling, not the other way around. Fourth thing. The Bible says love is a skill. I mean, it's something that you improve. You get better at this the more you do it. Love is a skill that can be learned, and you, you can really get good at being a person who loves God and who loves other people. You can be an expert on that, and we ought to be experts in relationships as God's people. Out of all the things our church can be known for, I mean, you can be known for, hey, they have a great vacation Bible school. They have great facilities. Uh, they help the community. They do, there are a lot of things we can be known for as a church. But I would love that when people think about our church, I'd love for them to say, that's the most loving group of people ever. I mean, they, they'll take you. They don't, they don't matter where you come from, where you've been, uh, what you look like. 
that's a place where people are loved. And uh, they're going to, when you, when you go in there, they, they're going to love you. And they're going to go outside their walls, and they're going to love you out there too. But they're going to love you too much just to leave you wherever they find you. They're going to love you enough to encourage you to love like Jesus loves. And to care about the things he cares about in his loving heart. And uh, I would like very much, especially in this contentious year ahead of us, that we could be that kind of lighthouse in the darkness as a lighthouse of love. Now, the Bible says, dear friends, let us practice loving each other. And that's, uh, this is from the Living Bible. And that's actually a, a really accurate translation of that part of things because it's a present active verb form. Let us make it a habit. Practice loving each other. For love comes from God and those who are loving and kind show that they are the children of God and that they are getting to know Him better. The only way you get skilled at something is to practice it. And there are things that you know, the first time I tried a whole lot of stuff, I wasn't very good at it. First time I tried to learn how to water ski, I drank a lot of water that I did not want to drink. I was trying to learn how to shoot a jump shot. Uh, it was, there was a lot of ugly shots before I got the rhythm of it and the flow of it and all the things that went into it. But the more you practice something, you just get better at whatever you're practicing. We want to be experts in love. So we're going to practice loving each other. And this verse says also, and, I, and I've, I think I've hit this verse now three times in this hour together. How you do this is an indicator of whether or not you're saved, whether or not you belong to God, whether or not you're going to heaven when you die. This isn't just a peripheral matter. This is an evidence. There's well, well, you know, I, I go to church. Well, my grandmother, she was a wonderful woman. Well, I got baptized. I, I uh, prayed this prayer, went through confirmation. Everybody has their list of stuff. But you know what? This is one of those measures of the fruit of a person who belongs to Jesus. And one of the things, they're going to be people of great love for God and for not just easy people to love, but everybody else. Fifth thing, love is a habit. You can't claim to be a loving person unless you are habitually loving. So your character, you think about your character. Your character is the sum of your habits. You take all those habits, that's who you are. You can, you can say, well, this is the way I am. This is who I am. This is what I believe. This is what's most important to me. But your habits are what's really a demonstration of what's really inside of you. So if love... It's like a light switch. Okay, uh, I'm uh, going out to do outreach in the community. I'm going to go do uh, caring for the uh, people in need in our community. Light on. I'm all love. Okay, light off. I'm back at home. And now it's all law all the time. And I'm mean-spirited and difficult at home. Or I'm, uh, I'm all love on Sunday morning. Monday morning, light off. It's dog eat dog out there now, and I'm going to win this dog fight. And if there's, it's a light switch situation, that's not what love is. Love happens when you love the unlovely, the unlovable, the difficult to love. Jesus said, if you love those, Jesus said, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. You, know, you can be a complete pagan and love your family, if everything's rolling along okay at family, or your friends that you love doing stuff together, and if you love them, well, great. So can somebody who knows nothing about this book, nothing about Jesus, nothing about the love of God. They can do, they can be nice to people who are nice to them they already have a relationship with. This is a big deal. If you say, I'm a loving person because I love those who love me, I love my family. I love my good friends. That's not being a loving person. Being a loving person is when you love the unlovely, when you love people who don't love you, when you love people who just outright irritate you, when you love people who backbite you, gossip about you, attack you, anybody who can love people who love them. That doesn't take any character at all. There's no character development uh, that's happening unless you start loving that group of people. So I can't claim to be loving unless I am habitually loving. Same thing if I say to, say to my wife, 
I recommit myself in 2020. I'm, this year, I'm going to be faithful to you 90% of the time. That's not faithful. If I say, I'm going to be honest with you, and I'm going to push it because it's a new year, I'm going to be honest with you 98% of the time. That's not honesty. It, it's not love until it's all the time love, until every corner of your life is reflecting that true in a lot of different areas. And I'm going to be kind, not unless you're habitually kind. Love has to become a lifestyle, like all those other things need to become a lifestyle. The Bible says in Hebrews, let brotherly love continue. Continue means make a habit of it all the time, every day. Not just uh, when it's convenient, not just when it works out, not just when you feel comfortable with it, but all the time, I'm going to be a person of love, not just light switch on, light switch off. The Bible says, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. That's a big, uh, scary note. Examine yourselves. Or do you yourselves not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test? This, is, this, this thing about love, love for God, love for everybody else, is not just a peripheral issue. It is core to, do I belong to Jesus or not? Am I going to heaven when I die or not? It makes it a pretty big deal. I recognize places in my life, plenty of places in my life where I'm pretty good at it, here, 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 but I see the deficits in me. I know me far too well. And there are a lot of areas in my life I need to work on, for sure. But one day, I'm going to stand before God and give an account for this life He has entrusted to me. And for sure, one of the things he, He's going to want to know from me is, what did you do with this life? Did you love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And did you, did you love your neighbor as yourself? Did you do those two things? There are a lot of other things He may uh, want, to, want to poke into in my life, for sure. But those two things are big things because Jesus said they're the most important thing. and Not just, not just did I love my family, but did I learn to love other people? Did I really, really love God and reflect it in how I love other people? In some of Jesus' last words to his disciples, this is not long before he was heading to the cross, he was given this just barrage of last-minute instructions for these folks. And he said this, and uh, it's such a telling verse about church and about church community. He took talking to this group of his closest followers. He says, by this all men will know that you're my disciples. If you have a Jesus fish thing on the back of your car. By this all men will know you're my disciples. If you have a bumper sticker that says what you're for and what you're against. By this, all men will know you're my disciples if you have crosses as decorations and jewelry and around your home. By this, they'll know you're my disciples if, uh, if uh, Jesus is the reason for your season. The symbol of a genuine follower of Jesus the Christ is love. And do people know, I mean, the people that know you I mean, your family, the, your neighbors, people at work, people in the community that you're interacting with through what your kids are doing, all that stuff. When they think about you, they think, that's a person that there's something so different about them. It just stands out as weird in this world that they really, really love other people. And it's because they really, really love God. The people characterize you in that way. And... That's my goal for me. That's my goal for us together. When people think about this place, they'd say, by this, all those people out there will know that the people in here belong to him because of how they love one another. And we sure got to stick together and love one another in this contentious year before us. How badly do you want to have better relationships? Well, it'd be handy because sometimes relationships are hard, so... I, I can work that in. Uh, I can work a little of it in here and here. And that is not wanted bad enough. Not wanting a way that honors this Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, can't be a light switch. Can't come and go. It has to become your dominant life value. And you just have to decide. This is going to be important to me. This simple command from Christ that 
that covers all of life. It makes everything else about life make sense in a Christ-honoring way. I want to learn how to love in 2020. Jesus said that one day we're going to be evaluated on why God put us on the planet, why he gave us this lifetime. And he didn't put you here to live for yourself. He put you here to learn some lessons that will prepare you for eternity because his plan is a lot bigger. than I feel good about my life today. I don't feel good about my life today. It's a big sweeping plan for all the ages. And this, this just has to take precedence over everything else. Life is not about achievements. Life is not about accomplishments. Life is not about acquisition. It's about relationships. And in God's economy, loving him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourself, that's the main thing. And what I want us to do together and individually and as families in this year, let's do an upgrade of how we love.